We've learned from our previous lessons that of the three different types of matter, elements, compounds, and mixtures, only mixtures can be separated into their components through what we call physical separation techniques. In this video, we are going to go through the multiple different separation techniques which can be utilized to separate mixtures depending on their properties. The first technique that we'll look at is sieving. Now sieving is a technique that we use to separate fine particles from coarse particles. The sieve itself is a perforated mesh of different size. And as we can see on the diagram on the right hand side, the particles which are too large are unable to fit through the mesh and thus become trapped in their layers. This separation technique is based on the size of the particles. Now we use sieving for a multitude of reasons, including separating clumps of powder, such as with our flour or sugar, separating any solids that have been suspended in liquids, and often in gold panning. Now the next technique that we'll look at is magnetic separation. This one is quite self-explanatory, and it is where we are using a magnet to separate a substance which is magnetic from one that is non-magnetic. So the example here, again, given on the right-hand side, is going to be if we had a mixture of salt and iron, and since salt is not magnetic, using a magnet will allow us to remove the iron filings while leaving the salt in place. And so this separation technique is based on magnetism. Filtration is a technique which is used to separate insoluble substances from a solution. Now this method of filtration demonstrated will likely be familiar to most students who have conducted filtration at school. In this process, we have a funnel that's lined with the porous paper, or in this case, the filter paper, and then the solution containing the insoluble and soluble substance mixture is then poured and passed through the filter. Clearly, the insoluble substance we should expect will remain on top of the filter paper while the liquid is able to pass through the paper into the beaker below the funnel. Now, an example of where we might see filtration is if we were collecting salt water from a sample of seawater. This separation must then be based on solubility. Other common applications of filtration will include water purification for drinking, or even when you're brewing coffee or tea using the pour over method. These are both examples of filtration. Sedimentation and decantation is similar to filtration in that you're trying to remove a liquid from an insoluble solid. And actually it consists of two techniques. Now the first technique is called sedimentation, and that's where we allow the sediments or the denser solids to settle at the bottom of the beaker. We then decant the mixture, meaning that we pour out the liquid to leave the unwanted solids behind. Now this is a quick method which we can use to separate our mixture, but it's ineffective. And the limitations of this include how it is easy to pour out accidentally some of the unwanted solid along with the liquid. This separation technique is based on solubility, but primarily it is based on density. Now because of the quickness of the sedimentation and decantation method, it can be found in use when wine pouring or in cooking. So evaporation and crystallization are another set of two techniques which we use to retrieve dissolved solids from a sample of liquid. Once the solid has become dissolved in the solvent, we then evaporate the solution as demonstrated in step two of the diagram. Because the solution has become heated, it will become oversaturated since the solubility of the solid in the hot solvent will then increase. Once it begins to cool, the crystallization will begin whereby the crystals will start to precipitate out of the solution. And finally, for us to get the rest of our, our crystals, we are going to filter it. Now, normal distillation is a technique which we use to purify liquids. The diagram on the right hand side is going to demonstrate to us a piece of distillation equipment where we have a round bottom flask filled with a mixture of liquids attached to a piece of equipment which we call a condensation chamber. The components which are found in the round bottom flask are vaporized from the heat of the flame and turned into a gas. Now because the flask is stopped at the top, the gases then have to travel to the tube on the side where they enter the condensation chamber. Cold water passes through the condensation chamber so that the gaseous liquid which reaches this point is then condensed and travels down into the beaker for our purified liquid in the bottom. Now this separation technique is based on the boiling point because only the most volatile liquid in this round bottom flask will evaporate and become condensed. As an extension, there is another method of distillation which is called fractional distillation. Now with fractional distillation, the column is filled with glass beads or what we call a fractioning column. Because the beads are colder 
The gas will then recondense and fall back down to the chamber to be reheated and revaporized, allowing us to essentially distill the liquid hundreds of more times than we possibly would. Distillation is used for a number of purposes. We use it for the purification of gases, including nitrogen and oxygen, when we use extremely low temperatures and where the gases exist in liquid form. We can also use it for petroleum refinery and alcohol refinery. This is a typical industrial fractional distillation method which we learn about in school. On the right hand side we have something called a fractional distillation tower, which is used often in the separation of crude oil. The tower has multiple different gradients of heat, which are then used to separate the different components of the crude oil, and the basis of this separation technique is again boiling point. Let's go into a little more detail about how this works. In the bottom chamber, which is the hottest, the hydrocarbons which are able to be boiled off will rise up through the chamber, while everything else that cannot be boiled at a temperature of 350 degrees will sink to the bottom and be released as residue. Now this residue will often consist of things such as bitumen and wax. The remaining non-residual crude oil is then rising through the different layers which as I mentioned earlier have different temperatures and then the subsequent non-boiling substances will recondense and leave through that chamber because it's cooler there. This means that as we move up the distillation tower, the substances are more and more volatile or have a lower and lower boiling point. Now the final separation technique we will look at is the separating funnel. This is one that we use for the separation of immiscible liquids. And immiscible liquids are ones which do not mix into one another, such as oil and water which we can see in this diagram. The water layer of the mixture will appear clearly defined and separated from the oil layer on the top. This method is simple in that we open the tap of the separating funnel called the stopcock, and the water layer will pass through the bottom into our beaker. Now there's a few things that we need to be careful of when we're using the separating funnel. In the laboratory situation, you'll often be required to mix the mixture inside of the separating funnel, which is often closed at the top with a rubber stopper or with some sort of cap. Now when you do this, you must remember to relieve the pressure by inverting the mixture, meaning you flip this upside down with the cap on, and you open the stopcock because the building of pressure from the reaction of substances in the ether and the water layer may cause it to explode. An issue with using this method is that we may under or overestimate when we are doing the separation, meaning that we might get some oil which we don't want, or we may leave some water which we do want.